If you're a fan of politics, a fan of history, or just a fan of great New Yorkers, then the latest Ken Burns documentary airing this week on PBS is Can't Miss Television. It focuses on three Roosevelts, First Lady Eleanor, and two presidents, Theodore and Franklin. They belonged to different parties. They overcame different obstacles. They had different temperaments and styles of leadership. But it was the similarities and not the differences between the two that meant the most to history. Both were children of privilege who came to see themselves as champions of the working man and earned the undying enmity of many of those among whom they'd grown to manhood. Both were hugely ambitious, impatient with the drab notion that the mere making of money should be enough to satisfy any man or nation. And each took unabashed delight in the great power of his office to do good. Each refused to surrender to physical limitations that might have destroyed them. And each had an uncanny ability to rally men and women to his cause. So there are two of those traits that are common to both men that were in that clip that are worth examining. The first is that both of them were progressives. That is, they believe the role of government is to improve people's lives. Both, as you know, came from vast wealth, but thought that government and society shouldn't necessarily favor the wealthy or the business class. Teddy Roosevelt pushed for what he called a square deal, saying that while not everybody can be dealt the cards or play them in a winning manner, the government should make sure that the game itself was fair to all. Franklin Roosevelt took that a step further with the New Deal. He used government as the employer of last resort during the Depression and the build-up to World War II, established Social Security. We got labor unions, workplace safety, and child labor laws, and he really helped solidify the role of the middle class. <clears throat> this has been a pretty interesting debate in America for the last 35 years or so about what the role of government should be. Should the role of government be a force for good to, to try to improve people's lives, or should it be, be to do as little as possible? And it seems like the pendulum has swung back to the more conservative argument in the last 35 years that it should stay out of people's lives, even if that means not necessarily providing people help. Well, except that that shift is now shifting it once again. I think de Blasio represents that very, uh, that argument. I don't agree with it, by the way. I think uh, my own personal view is that government should come help those who are truly needy in some cases. But the FDR re uh, way of doing things, uh, I think, was a mistake in many counts. By the way, the Supreme Court said he was, he was wrong and he exceeded his power on several occasions. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at it, uh, both men changed America dramatically. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt, not so much for his, his, his policies socially, but in terms of conservation efforts and parks throughout the, throughout the country, uh, we all benefit from that today. So that kind of thinking ahead, which I've always appreciated, is something that we all enjoy today that I think a government had a responsibility to do to try to preserve uh, those, those parcels. But Th those sentiments are dead on arrival today. Dead on arrival. Forget it. You have people that go to Congress with the sole premise of cutting and stopping government. Period. That's the goal. Cut, cut, cut. The Northerners, those folks in New York, they're taking all of our government dollars with their social programs. Cut it. We don't care. So that we, we want that type of official. But, but Andrew, that, that's dead on arrival today. Look, there, there are very negative connotations when it comes to government and business, and it really should not be that way. Government, as, as explained earlier, should be there to help level the playing field so everybody has an opportunity. It's more of a cynical approach, unfortunately, now. Uh, you know, you heard the words, here, hi, I'm here from the government, I'm here to help. You know, those are the worst things you can hear. Reagan said, you know, if, if it moves, tax it. If it doesn't move at all, uh, subsidize it. If it moves too fast, regulate it. I mean, that's essentially where government has gone. But the, but the same thinking was in play before Theodore Roosevelt was elected and before Franklin mm -hmm. Roosevelt was elected, and it, it changed because people felt the pendulum had swung too far. And it, is, it is refreshing to be amongst my colleagues because all of a sudden I'm not the cynical one, and ordinarily I really <laughs> am. Um, I think what both what these, the Roosevelts had in common was a, a, a willingness to insist on bold action and to assign the role of bad guy and, and the wrongdoer to someone. In, in Teddy Roosevelt's case, it was, it was trusts. And in FDR's case, it was big business and wealthy folks who weren't willing to pay their share. And he had his court packing plan. I think that's what we're not seeing today is leadership in whatever direction. It could be a more conservative, pragmatic view. It could be a more progressive, expansive view. Um, but it's a willingness to actually say, they're wrong. We're right. I'm going to rally the people around me. 
and we're going to insist on decisive action. And there were folks even to the left of FDR in a sort of populist mode like Huey Long and during Teddy Roosevelt's time, um, businesses had sway over large parts of America that weren't regulated. It wasn't like the Wild West, it was still the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And he insisted on uh, the supremacy of the federal government decades ahead of his, his younger class. Last thing I would say is that what we've got to focus on in this country is education. Education is the great equalizer. With that investment, people can achieve what they need to achieve. No and be one successful. here is voting for you. You don't have to. <laughs> what, what's with these talking points of platitudes? We're talking about the role yeah, of government. Vote like, already, so well, government controls what, education. Uh, what this <laughs> is real. What what he just said is real for the American. I mean, granted, this is a political conversation, but let's face it: half the country doesn't vote. Why doesn't half the country Teddy vote? Teddy Roosevelt or Franklin Roosevelt would have taken a bank into the middle of Times Square after the financial crisis and left it dead in the middle for everybody to see that that could happen and the world economy doesn't collapse. But this president was too tepid. Other presidents were too tepid. You're that's right what, that's what was different about it. I that. don't care what we're saying. You're right on education. That's, that's All right, I want to get to another co uh, common trait that both Roosevelt's had. And it wasn't about necessarily their political views, but also their health and their electability. Teddy Roosevelt, now widely seen as almost certainly depressive. His mother and his first wife died on the same day in the same house. And it was likely bipolar, often given to rage and making outbursts that the guy who makes the biography, Ken Burns, said was like Howard Dean's scream moment in Iowa in 2004. And that moment all but disqualified Dean from the White House. Burns says Roosevelt might have had 10 of those moments in a given day. Franklin Roosevelt was crippled by polio in 1921. For the rest of his life, he needed leg braces or a wheelchair, but he shielded that from the public, was still elected governor of New York, and was elected president four times. And his handicap would almost certainly be a disqualifying event in today's politics. And if you don't believe me, name any current or recent president, senator, congressman, or governor who cannot walk. Illinois Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth lost both her legs in the Gulf War, but she uses prosthetics, prosthetics excuse me, and still walks. Only Greg Abbott, who's likely to be the next governor of Texas, comes to mind. He's in a wheelchair after surviving a car accident. Now, one of the Roosevelt's that's in this biography is on Mount Rushmore, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are both widely considered to be great presidents, even if we disagree with some of their policies. Are we disqualifying potentially critical people from our public office because we're too naive or we're too vain or we demand too much of a, a strength image from the people that we elect, Dominic? It's not disqualifying but it does mean that you're going to have to work that much harder mm -hmm. if you have uh, such a disability or some type of physical characteristic that the voter can see. Let's face it, we're in an age, why was Obama so popular? Why did 80,000 people turn out to a stadium to see this new uh, senator, brand new senator from the state of Illinois? He's a dynamic speaker and he plays well on TV. He was a, he's a good speaker. I've listened to him live numerous times. In my opinion, he's not as good as we give him credit for. He, g he gave that great spe speech at the convention in Boston, and that catapulted him to the national stage. But let's face it, he's a good-looking guy. Let's face it. Women voters were gravitating towards him. Not fully African-American, not fully white, a new dynamic. In this day and age, you've got to be fresh good-looking, articulate, as, as uh, Biden said Obama was, in order to succeed in politics. I mean, look, the, the, the reality is this, from the beginning, that's just on the presidential level, we looked at leaders. George Washington was a military leader, uh, and he was our first president. In fact, I think it was Harrison who gave a speech in the rain without a top hat and a coat, and then died six months later because of a flu, because it was the gravitas. You mm -hmm. know, you had to show leadership and strength, and that's always been what Americans have looked at for their leaders is leadership and strength. And if you, unfortunately, you know, us being as we are, and, and, and it's unfortunate that, you know, if, if you have some type of disability, then, then you can't be uh, in a position of strength. Couldn't, I, I mean, you can make the argument that that shows even more strength, being able to overcome those Absolutely. obstacles. Well, I think no, it does. Sure. I think it does. I think part of the problem is not so much that the public has disqualified anybody. It's the rigors of campaign. It's the efforts. I mean, it is t having to do this today, campaigning on a, on a state basis or a national basis, is exhausting, tiring. That's number one. Number two, I mean, people today don't pull punches, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the kinds of ads they run, the kinds of things that they, they imply in their ads, 
really make make a mockery of some cases of people who are not quite the same as them. And he I, was, he was I no shrinking you. violent FDR. They did have those sorts of ads, and there was a whispering campaign. But it was was a different time, and I think we're missing out on a lot of talented well, people. Kennedy and I think too. it's limiting. I agree with that. Yeah. If, if, if we're talent. missing out on a, a, mm -hmm. a talent at a time where everybody complains about government, so we Agreed. clearly need the talent. How do we change that? Can we change that? Can we get to a point I, where we're, I we don't care that, about that those we things? Are, we don't have full and frank discussions of disabilities. Um, in, in my house, FDR had a, a vault of wanted position, uh, not just because of his progressive politics, but because of his polio. My mother, as a young girl, had polio. She caught in one of the last oh. epidemics in New York City. So this is something we always talked about in the house and celebrated, but I don't think that... Uh, I don't think we have full and frank conversations well, about Well, can you imagine a president or a governor or, or mayor of a major city mm -hmm. saying, I suffer from bipolar? Uh, how do, does that affect Rob their decision? Ford. There's I so mean, many you could make <laughs> the argument. <laughs> uh, he, but he, he stepped down. Though, right. right. Okay. Right. But the question, but the American, I think the public is so ill-informed about some of these illnesses and their effects and how they can so be there controlled. There is a difference in mental health issues and having a physical, physical disability. disability. Yeah. But it's nevertheless, the, the, I think the people need to be informed about how these disabilities or mental illness actually affect the ability to do the job. That's, I think we need more information about that. Well, and we then need, we have more candidates. We need good people, so whatever yeah. it takes, we can, uh, we can hopefully agree on that. All right, up next, students on Staten Island take a stand against their school's dress codes. Are dress codes and uniforms really the best way to go?